Today we are reviewing when you should absolutely be placing at least two IVs in your patient, simple but the only tips you'll need for placing IVs, and a question at the end to help you ensure you build a solid foundation of ER nursing knowledge. So IVs are critical to emergency care because they are what allow us to provide life-saving interventions such as IV fluids, blood products, and pressors, and antibiotics, and countless other medications and supportive therapy. They are the backbone of the ER. Sometimes only one IV is necessary, but there will be times where you need to prioritize obtaining a second IV as well. So when should you have at least two IVs? At least two IVs are going to be essential for critical patients, such as severe trauma patients or critical medical patients, such as those in sepsis, cardiac arrest, DKA, and so forth. Critical ill patients will need multiple medications and IV fluids. Some of these meds and fluids will not be compatible with each other, so multiple IV lines allow for the ordered interventions to be given in a timely manner. The other benefit is that in case one of the IVs goes bad, having another, having a backup is essential, especially when the patient is on vasopressors, sedation meds, and so forth. Another reason for having two IVs is a blood transfusion. A second IV is needed during transfusions because you want to avoid the contamination and interactions with the blood if you're just using that one line for everything. Certain medications may cause the blood to hemolyze or to clot off. You also want to have a second line just in case there's an adverse reaction, such a transfusion reaction, and you need to take care of the patient since these patients become very sick very rapidly. And then if they're getting blood for a reason, you don't want to disrupt this important intervention by constantly having to stop it to give other uh, medications through that same line. Another reason for a second IV will be uh, thrombolytic administration. You should avoid poking your patient after thrombolytics. So if you are able to obtain a second line beforehand, you should, right? It helps have a backup to assist with man managing complications of thrombolytic administration. As you know, the biggest complications are going to be intracranial hemorrhage and GI bleeding. And if you've experienced in a severe GI bleeding in the past, you know that these patients require uh, massive transfusions at a time, and so you need to have multiple IVs for that as well. And then another reason to have a second line would be a heparin infusion. A, so heparin is a blood thinner and it's often used as an infusion for pulmonary embolisms and STEMIs, DVTs, and so forth. The infusion is continuous and should not be interrupted as this decreases its effectiveness. You also, again, want to avoid poking a patient on a blood thinner and you need to have a backup just in case one of the IVs uh, goes bad. And then the backup will help manage complications, like we said, like bleeding. Now, let's go over quick tips for placing IV. So the first one is that you need to let gravity help you. Place the tourniquet on at least four inches above where you're gonna be poking. Drop the arm to let gravity fill the vessels up. The next is that you need to give the area and the veins some good love taps, right? Nursing schools are teaching uh, that you shouldn't be uh, doing the taps anymore, but in the heat of the moment, especially in the ER, giving a few taps, it really does help the veins pop out more. And if needed, a second tourniquet can help do the trick. Don't forget to ask the patient where they normally have IVs placed. The difficult patients typically know where they have a decent hidden vein that you can get an IV in. And then when you're looking for veins, don't forget your anatomy. There's the AC veins, the medic vein, the hand, and even the wrist. In emergency situations, we place the IV where we can. We don't worry about the joints and other stuff, right? The patient needs critical life-saving interventions ASAP, so we want to place the IV where we can. Of course, you're going to be avoiding areas that have like a dialysis, fistula, and so forth, but we're not worried about um, placing an IV on the wrist or in the AC where, it, where the movement is because, again, they're needing those life-saving interventions. And an additional tip for placing IVs, if you know your patient is going to need a PE study, place an 18 gauge in the AC early on. If you know they're going to be getting blood, place ideally an 18, but a 20 should be okay. Base what you place depending on what the patient is there for, because that will create less work for you down the road, right? But of course, sometimes we just can't get the ideal size, so just get what you can so you can start the initial resuscitation. And by the way, if you're finding this helpful and want to save time and energy with mastering the chaos of the ER, check out our book and course. They're packed with everything you need, including foundational material, quizzes, and practical tips to help you become confident and more prepared in the ER. You can also join the channel as a member and gain access to the course by clicking the join button. You can find the links in a pinned comment and in the description box below. So now for the question of the day, 
What electrolyte result do you need to have prior to starting the insulin infusion for DK patients and why? So again, what electrolyte result do you need to have prior to starting the insulin infusion for DK patients and why? So before starting an insulin infusion for DKA patients, we must have the potassium levels uh, back because if it's too low, we need to correct it. If potassium is less than 3.5, insulin therapy should be delayed. And again, potassium supplementation should begin immediately. As you know, if the potassium is already low, by giving insulin, you're going to shift more potassium into cells, leading to severe hypokalemia and life-threatening issues. As you know, potassium has effects on the heart. And if a potassium level is very low, um, it will throw your patients into arrhythmia, such as ventricular tachycardia, ventricular fibrillation, and even a systole. So if the potassium level is less than a uh, rule of thumb 3.5, hold the insulin and give potassium supplementation first. If the result comes back between 3.5 to 5, start the insulin infusion and administer potassium with the IV fluid. If it's greater than 5, you can start the insulin infusion but monitor potassium levels carefully. As a result of the insulin uh, driving potassium into cells and the deadly arrhythmias that can happen as a result of hypokalemia, you need to be doing chemistry checks every 2 to 4 hours. And with your chemistry checks, you're going to have your potassium level as well as your gap level for DKA, right? And then just make sure that you keep an eye on it. If you first started with a potassium level greater than five, but now it's dropping, you need to communicate with the team so that potassium is added to those IV fluids. Again, just to prevent the, prevent the hypokalemia and those uh, deadly arrhythmias that we discussed. And as always, teamwork makes the dream work. And here at Emergency Chaos, we are proactive, not reactive.